Thank you very much, Christoph, and uh, thank you uh, for, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'm gonna uh, tell you about data-driven uh, materials design, some of the latest work we've, we've done in that, uh, in that uh, area. And um, just to, uh, to begin with, um, what, what I mean when I say materials design is um, the opposite of what I'm showing you here. So in this case, uh, which is the typical case, we have some kind of physical system that could be a, a, a catal catalytic nanoparticle that uh, performs some kind of, of, of catalytic reaction. And we can compute the, uh, the energies uh, along the reaction pathways. And then we can use that to uh, guide the experimentalists when they interpret their experiments. What we would like to do in, in um, materials design is to reverse this arrow and start from over here and say, we would love to find a catalytic nanoparticle that has a small as possible a barrier within a certain um, set of, of possible materials. Can you please tell me which, uh, which material I should go and synthesize in order to create this fantastic uh, catalytic nanoparticle? And to do that, uh, one can use various methods. One of them is high throughput screening, and I'll give you one example of, of that. Machine learning is, of course, uh, perhaps more uh, interesting uh, because there is some kind of intelligence behind that. High throughput screening is very much brute force, calculate a lot of structures and pick the one that performs the best. And uh, in this process, we need materials databases. So I'll also be talking about materials databases. And okay, so here is a, a brief outline of, of what I am going to, to talk about. So I'm going to talk about um, in half of the talk approximately about 2D materials because that's a field where we've been uh, quite active over the past 10 years or so. Uh, and in particular, the computational 2D materials database, which is a particular open uh, database that we develop. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we've, uh, how we've done that. Um, and in, in the process of, of developing that database, it became apparent to us that we need some infrastructure to, to handle all these thousands or hundreds of thousands of calculations that have to be performed. So um, we have developed some, some um, Python tools for performing high throughput computations and automated workflows. And I'll tell you a bit about that as well. Uh, and then move on to uh, generative models for creating crystal structures. And this is again uh, in the realm of 2D materials where we've trained a model to come up with, with uh, new stable 2D uh, crystal structures. Um, and then because I would also like to tell you some science um, and not just infrastructure and, and technicalities, I'll also give you an example of uh, a recent study where we looked at indirect uh, semiconductors for thin film photovoltaics. And here the challenge is to account for the, for the phonon assisted processes that are required to, to um, absorb light in an indirect band gap semiconductor. And then finally, if there is time, uh, I, will, I will show you how machine learning can be used to, to predict many body uh, GW band structures from DFT input. So basically learning from DFT and predicting uh, GW quality band structures. Okay, so, so uh, just a, a very uh, brief introduction to the field of 2D materials. I'm sure that, that uh, most of you, if not all of you are familiar with, with that field. Uh, it really uh, took off uh, when the Nobel Prize was, was awarded uh, in 2010 um, for the discovery of graphene, of course. And here I'm, I'm just showing some of the milestone discoveries, some of the most important discoveries that have shaped the field of 2D material science over the past 10 years. Um, so MOS2 is one example of a material that becomes a direct band gap semiconductor when you thin it down from bulk to, to a monolayer. Um, the year after MOS2 was used in, in the first sort of uh, atomically thin um, transistor, um, then it was found that MOS2 is also um, has this uh, valley spin locking that can be used for valleytronics and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go through all of these examples here, um, but this is basically just 
meant to show that there is a lot of activity in this field and there is a lot of interest in finding new types of 2D materials. Uh, I can say that another area where we are quite active at the moment is uh, looking at defects in 2D materials. Um, such defects can be used to emit single photons and uh, to store um, localized electron spins and that has some potential within um, quantum technologies. 2D magnetism is also quite a hot topic these days. So that's also an area where we are working. Uh, more rest structures, twistronics and slidetronics, where one can slide layers relative to each other and uh, use that to change the polarization of the material electrically is, is also a very interesting um, subfield of 2D materials. So um, there is around 100 2D materials so far that have been uh, experimentally synthesized, but um, we thought let's try to see you know, how many 2D materials are out there uh, and are stable. Uh, so what we've done over the past six, seven years by now is to develop a, a database of such 2D materials. And we, we follow two approaches when we construct these 2D materials. One of them is sort of a bottom up approach where we start from well-known uh, crystal structures that are known from experiments. And then we decorate the lattice with different uh, elements and create hypothetical 2D materials. Then we compute whether they're stable or not. And if they are stable, we calculate properties of those. We can also do a top down approach where we start from a known layered bulk compound, and then we exfoliate the layers and um, run them through our workflow and compute properties. Um, so these workflows, they, they result in hundreds of thousands or millions of calculations, and you will uh, uh, pretty soon start like looking uh, like uh, this person down here if you don't have an automated way a structured way of, of handling all these calculations. Um, and here is a view graph that I borrowed from Giovanni Pizzi that shows how complicated such workflows can, can be. Um, these three guys have worked on a Python framework for creating workflows. And this is also worked on within the NOMAD uh, Center of Excellence. Morten Kjerding started this when we started the C2DB project. We figured out we had to to, to create some scripts that could be shared among all the people in the group. And we just had to run those scripts and then we could perform all these calculations. But th that didn't really work out. We had to do it more systematically. And then as Larsen uh, came a couple of years ago to the group and, and he started doing some very nice work um, that we now call the Atomic Simulation Recipes, which is a, a very modular and flexible uh, Python framework for, for creating workflows and managing them. And Jens Jan Mortensen, who's also the main developer of the GPO electronic structure code that I'll mention on a, on a later slide. Uh, he is also in, involved in this uh, and he has developed the MyQ um, code, which is a simple uh, front end to uh, Slurm, PBS, different, uh, different um, job managers mm -hmm. that, that makes it easy to sort of overview the jobs you have in your queue and um, the status of the different jobs and just makes it a lot more fun to perform high throughput computations. So the MyQ software is actually detached from ASR. These are two separate things, but ASR makes use of, of MyQ as, as the engine to submit calculations to the supercomputer. Uh, so here are the, the main components of the atomic simulation recipes. We, um, we're using the atomic simulation environment, which is a, a, a Python environment for, for working with atomistic simulations. We're using that to, as interface to the atomic simulation code. And <clears throat> the atomic simulation environment, um, it has interfaces to about 30 different simulation codes at the moment. Uh, it's a very active user community, uh, more than 260 people have contributed to it over, over the years. Um, so it's highly community driven. We just had a hackathon on, on the ASE a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we gathered about uh, 20 people and, and worked on the interfaces between ASE and various DFT codes, including the VASP code, uh, but, but uh, a number of other codes as well. And because that is, that is needed if we want this to 
to fly. If you want to make code agnostic workflows, so workflows where you can run them with VASP, you can run them with GPOL, you can run them with CASTEP or whatever, by just changing which calculator you want to run with. That's the long-term goal of this. Uh, that requires well-developed and well-thought-through interfaces between ASC and the electronic structure flows, obviously. So this is work that is going on within the NOMAD uh, Center of Excellence at the moment. Um, so the, the way this works uh, is we have uh, task functions that are Python functions written in ASC that can perform some particular well-defined task that could be relax a structure, uh, it could be set up a structure, run a Nikki reduction uh, on, the, on the unit cell, uh, whatever, um, but a simple well-defined function. So that's a library of functions over here. Then we have workflows that is simply um, a set of these task functions that are decorated to become an ASR task, uh, such that we automatically can keep track of all the metadata that is generated, all the parameters that were used, and also the output of the file, um, and such that we can collect databases out of that afterwards. And the task blaster is the backend that performs all this work. And the way it works is uh, sketched here. So we have our task functions that are these simple Python functions. We create a workflow out of those. Um, and then once we run the workflow, it creates tasks that are basically JSON files that contain the name of the function and all the input parameters. Um, and then we can hash that. And that hash code is kept in a registry that connects that hash code with the place on the file system where that JSON file is. So we have this very simple little uh, uh, database here that sort of relates this um, workflow graph to um, the relative path of, of the tasks that have to be executed. Um, I don't want to go into detail with this, but it turns out to be a, a, a nice, flexible, and, and relatively simple and transparent way of, 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 of performing workflow uh, calculations. Okay, then we have um, apps as well, so we can use to collect databases and put them uh, online uh, so they can be browsed. Um, um, and we have Python interface and we have the MyQ that we use as a front end to the uh, HPC scheduler, as mentioned before. So coming back to, uh, to the C2DB, uh, we have this uh, property workflow now that is written in the ASR. And what it does is you have some kind of 2D structure here. We start by relaxing it. Once it's relaxed, we check whether it's a 2D material because what can happen during relaxation is that the material breaks up and becomes something else than a covalently bonded 2D structure. We check whether it's a unique structure or whether it's already in the C2DB. Uh, then we do some uh, symmetry classification. We check whether it's magnetic or not. Um, we calculate the formation energy and we calculate the energy above the convex hull. And I just want to spend a few um, a little bit of time explaining what the energy above the convex hull is because I'm using that later on. So the heat of formation of a crystal is the energy of that structure relative to its uh, elemental phases, uh, which could be a solid phase or a gas phase, depending on what type of element it is. The energy above the convex hull is the energy relative to the most stable um, possible possibly mixed phases of the material. So not only the elemental reference states of the elements, but it could be any kind of structure that could be formed uh, out of the elements making up the material. Um, so that, that's really the key quantity if you want to say something about the thermodynamic stability of a material. So if that quantity is zero, it means that this is the most stable form of those elements that can be found. We calculate the stiffness tensor and the dynamical matrix. And only if the material is really both thermodynamically stable and dynamically stable, meaning it's not a saddle point we have found, but it's actually a local minimum, then we compute its properties and store it in the database. 
We have also created uh, uh, recently a similar database of bilayer structures, and we have created a database of point defects in these some of these monolayers, not all of them, obviously, but, but some of them. So I think the hope is that um, eventually this, this will make a digital platform that you can really use to explore 2D materials, point defects, stacked um, materials, and so on and so forth within one uh, consistent, consistent framework. Uh, if you go to the C2DB, this is what you will, you will find. You can uh, query uh, in the search field. You can write, for example, in OS2, and then you will get a lot of, of, of materials here, and you can click on the one you're interested in, and that could be this one, for example, which is the H phase of MOS2. And if you do that, you will see this page here that summarizes a number of basic properties of this materials. Of this material, you can look at the structure here, and then you have a long list of different properties that are computed. And you can click the question mark and get a description of what this is. And there are typically some references where you can go and learn more about this property. Uh, you can also click the panels, and then you will see, for example, in this case, the band structure, um, or in this case, the Raman spectrum of this particular 2D material. So uh, for about 4,000 of these monolayers, we have uh, computed this uh, uh, rather long list of, of, different, of different properties. And the latest properties we have added here, the second harmonics generation, shift currents, which is another second uh, order optical response function, and spontaneous polarization that is calculated via the, the Berry phase um, of the material. And now, once you have such a database, you can go on and, 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 uh, and mine it and look for interesting materials. And we've been looking at, at the 2D materials with particularly large uh, nonlinear optical properties. We've also looked for uh, 2D materials with uh, non-trivial topologies and uh, 2D ferromagnetic materials and, and a lot of other things. Um, right. Let me at this point say a little bit about the DFT code that we have used to produce all this data. It's the GPO code, which is an open source code that is written essentially in Python, uh, which makes it very uh, attractive, I would say, for people who would like to do development because it's, it's fairly straightforward to, to read it and contribute new functionality to it. Um, it's based on the PAW method and, and the unique feature of this code, apart from it, the fact that it's a Python code, is that it supports three different types of basic sets. So it has a real space grid that is uh, efficient if you have large systems because you can domain, you can parallelize over uh, domains in real space. It has a plane wave basis set like the VASP code and it has a, a numerical uh, atomic orbitals as well, like the Siesta code, if you're familiar with that one. And you, know, you can switch between these three different types of basis sets. And some basis sets are good for some applications and others are good for other applications. So that makes a, a pretty uh, a flexible and, and unique code. We are recently uh, performed a lot of work on refactoring the whole linear response and excited state part of GPOL. So um, um, this, is, this is work in progress, but it's going quite well. So, so um, this, this part of the code uh, will also become in, in even better shape um, within the not so distant future. Then it's very well integrated with the atomic simulation environment and the atomic simulation recipe workflow framework that I uh, discussed um, before. Okay, so now let me switch gears and talk about um, deep generative um, models for crystal structure um, generation. And as you know, generative models in the field of AI um, are very um, have become very powerful. You can use them to generate images. Uh, you can use them to generate language, natural language. You can use them to produce pictures and you can learn a style from a particular artist and use that in a, in a natural image as shown over here, for example. Um, the generative model that we have been using for, for generating crystal structures is a variational autoencoder. And the way it works is uh, just in a, in a, in a nutshell is that you have some input over here, an input vector, that could be a description of a crystal structure. What are the lattice vectors? 
which are the atoms and what are the position of those atoms. And then you have a neural network here that encodes that into a latent vector space, a low dimensional vector space, maybe with a dimensionality of 100. Uh, and then you have another neural network that can decode from the latent vector space and back to your real representation of your crystal structure in this case. Um, an important point is that in the latent space, you don't represent the crystal structures as points, but as distributions. Because when you do that, you can sort of interpolate between the different points in the latent space, as shown graphically over here. So it becomes possible um, to go from the latent space, latent space and interpolate uh, between the known crystals in the latent space. Another important um, aspect of this is that when you train the neural networks, the loss function contains obviously the reconstruction term, which says how good is the neural network, the decoder, to decode the result. But there is another term here that tries to group the uh, points or the distributions in the latent space together. Uh, so this term here makes sure that uh, you don't sort of get too far away that, that the crystal structures don't get too distant in the, in the Latin space. They try to confine them together. And that's very important to um, sort of organize crystal structures that are close together uh, in real life, so to speak, that they also get close together in the Latin space. Um, so we have taken this variational autoencoder here uh, uh, that was proposed in this, in this paper. And as you can see here, uh, this is a pretty complex um, um, model that contains no less than three different neural networks that have to be trained uh, in parallel. Um, so what it does is it takes the uh, crystal structure here, encodes it in a Latin space, and then it can predict the composition, the lattice, and the number of atoms. Uh, and based on that, it now creates a crystal structure by randomly placing the, uh, the atoms that it has predicted here. And then it denoises that. And denoising um, is, um, is, is a particular uh, kind of neural network that has been trained on known structures that have been sort of noise that have where the noise has been added to those structures. So it basically knows from those noisy structures how it should denoise them to get back to the original structure here. So by some kind of magic, this uh, model here can then, if you train it on stable materials, it can predict hopefully stable materials. But we set out to check whether it actually works because in the original paper, it wasn't really uh, tested that, that uh, thoroughly. So what we did, or uh, I should say my PhD student Peter here, what he did was he took, he took uh, 2,500 structures from the C2DB that had uh, an energy above the convex hull below 0.3 EV. Uh, and then he used this crystal diffusion variational autoencoder that I just showed you to create 10,000 crystal structures. And he optimized those with DFT um, some of them were duplicates, they were removed. Some of them were after relaxation, not 2D anymore, they were removed and some of the DFT calculations didn't uh, convert. So they were removed as well. So eventually he was left with 3000 2D crystals that had been generated by this um, generative model. And so he also used standard lattice decoration where he took these stable 2D materials as seed structures and replace the atoms by other atoms from the periodic table with similar chemical properties. Um, and that resulted in 8,500 approximately materials. And interestingly, the intersection between the two was only 22 um, materials that were the same created by the two methods here. So this is showing uh, whether this myth model actually learns the stability of the training data. So the dash curve here shows the energy above the convex hull of the training set. And the full line here shows the energy above the convex hull of the generated crystals. So you can see they are maybe not as stable as the training data, but if we train the model on a set of data, uh, on a set of crystal structures that are less stable, so described by this orange line here that 
uh, only includes materials that have an energy above the convex hull of 0.4 or above, then we get this full orange line here that is clearly uh, shifted upwards in energy as compared, to the, as compared to the blue one. So this shows that the crystal structures generated by the, um, by the generative model, when it's trained on more stable materials, it predicts more stable materials as it should. Um, but of course, stable materials, stability is not the only thing we would like. We would also like these materials to be different from the one it's trained on. And this is sort of a low dimensional representation of a feature that encodes the stoichiometry and the space group and the Y cup position um, of the structures. And the blue colors represent the training data and the um, orange colors is the lattice decorated structures where we just take the training data and substitute the atoms with other atoms. And the green is the uh, generative model. And what you can see is that the green dots do not overlap so much with the blue dots, right? So there are areas in this, um, in this space here where we predict structures that are not in the uh, training data. So the model really creates not just stable structures, but also structures that are both chemically and structurally distinct from the training data, uh, which is of course nice. And I think I'll go quickly over this, but we've calculated uh, we found 2,000 materials that are very close to the convex hull, so 2,000 materials that were not already in the C2DB, uh, and we have now calculated uh, a, a, lot, a lot of properties of these materials, and uh, we will, uh, we're looking forward to look more into this data set and see if we can find some, some interesting new com compounds um, there. Um, okay, so let me now move on to this uh, example here of a, of a screening study that uh, uh, Jiban, uh, who's a postdoc in my group, did recently. So he was looking at the uh, indirect band gap semiconductors for thin film photovoltaics. And, uh, you know, thin film photovoltaics is uh, sort of dominated by, by these uh, materials shown over here. Um, crystalline silicon is added here, uh, even though it's not a thin film, but this is just to have a, a, something to compare with. Um, most of these structures here are, are problematic. Most of these materials are problematic because they either contain poisonous elements, um, scarce elements, um, expensive elements. Um, so we would like to find materials that can harvest sunlight and provide high performance uh, photovoltaics in, in a thin film geometry um, based on abundant uh, elements. That's, that's the main uh, purpose of this study here. Um, Everything here that have been studied so far is direct band gap semiconductors because that's sort of obvious. If you want a thin film that absorbs a lot of light, uh, you would think of using a direct band gap material for that. Um, but it turns out that indirect band gap materials can actually also be quite, uh, quite interesting and have pretty high performances. Uh, what you need to compute that is you need the indirect absorption, which you can calculate from second order perturbation theory so that's a process that involves uh, not just a photon, but also a phonon. The phonon provides the momentum. So this is basically a, the expression that uh, we implemented. Um, and this is pretty demanding to compute because you can see you have to sum over K1, K2, conduction bands, valence band, and all the different phonon modes. So we came up with an approximation here uh, where we said, let's try to replace all the phonon frequencies with the phonon frequencies at the gamma point and the same thing for the electron phonon coupling we replace the electron phonon coupling at a general q point with the one at the gamma point and uh, so this is just graphically what it means for silicon we actually only include these phonons here at the gamma point we can we can sort of improve on the method by using a larger supercell then we also including the phonons at the high symmetry points and in that sense, eventually, when we make the supercell larger and larger, we converge to the exact result. But as you can see here, we already get pretty good results from the, um, from the uh, primitive unit cell. The blue dots here are the uh, experimental values for the absorption coefficient of silicon. 
uh, and you can see it starts here at one, which is the indirect band gap of silicon. The direct gap is a three EV, three EV, so it's much higher. And with our uh, very simple um, gamma point phone on approximation, we get the orange line, which when you convert this into uh, a photovoltaic efficiency, it's not uh, uh, exactly the same as, as, the, uh, as the green curve, which is uh, close to the experiments, but it's sort of, uh, it's sort of okay, in particular if we look in this region, which is the typical region for a thin film uh, solar cell or for a, a silicon solar cell. So uh, we used this um, method and calculated the uh, power conversion efficiency from this expression here, where essentially the only thing you need to put in is the absorption spectrum that contains a part from the uh, direct transitions and the indirect transitions as well. Um, so then we can calculate the efficiency here. Um, however, we also need that there are losses in addition to the radiative losses in a solar cell, there are also non-radiative losses. And uh, this we do not compute ab initio. So that's a free parameter here, which is the ratio between the radiative emission and the non-radiative emission. So if this is equal to one, it means there is no non-radiative recombination, so no losses in the solar cell. Um, but as this number becomes smaller and smaller, we simulate more and more non-radiative losses. Uh, and this you can see down here how it goes. The efficiency obviously drops when we increase the uh, amount of non-radiative losses. Uh, so we went through this workflow here where we started out with a couple of thousand uh, materials, uh, checked whether there was a ba direct band gap of not, or not. If there was not a direct band gap, we compute the uh, phone unassisted transitions. So we can get the full absorption spectrum of the material and eventually we evaluate the device efficiencies, uh, open circuit voltage, so on. And Right, I think in the interest of time, I can skip this one. Um, so now we have the efficiency, but there are other quantities that are important, of course, to make a good solar cell. And one of them is the uh, carrier mobility, which we can estimate by the effective mass. Uh, and if we do that, we can make these kind of plots here where we have efficiency and effective mass on the x-axis. And when on, based on this, we can sort of search for the materials that have that combine a high uh, efficiency with good transport properties. <coughs> and eventually we come up with a list here where we have sort of we find the well-known uh, uh, candidates. Uh, we have also a number of materials that are known, uh, emerging thin film solar cells. And then we find a number of uh, previously unexplored solar cells down here uh, that are interesting because they are sort of anion rich compounds. So many of these uh, are materials where the elements are in oxidation states that are non-standard. So I think of these materials here, I don't think any of them uh, have really been experimentally um, synthesized. There is a report on copper uh, P2 that was recently made in, uh, in thin film form. So, um, I think this, these will be very interesting to explore. And as you can see, most of these have actually indirect gaps. So this is the difference between the direct gap and the indirect gap. Uh, and despite of this, the efficiencies, as you can see over here, are actually quite decent. So it's, let's say, a new family of, of potential thin film uh, indirect band gap uh, solar cell materials. Um, so in the last five minutes, I would like to talk about how we can use machine learning to predict uh, GW band structures from DFT um, input. So as many of you probably know, um, DFT treats uh, electrons as essentially independent particles. So the uh, band gap is underestimated typically with most of the functionals. Uh, there are meta GGA, also some developed uh, uh, here that um, performs much better with respect to the band gap. Uh, but most of the standard functional actually uh, do not perform very well um, on the band gap. We need to account for screening. We can do that with the GW uh, self-energy method. And if we want to calculate optical excitations, we also have to account for electron hole interactions. 
uh, and excitonic effects. And if we do that, we can get pretty good uh, agreement with experiments. This is the absorption spectrum of uh, monolayer MOS2. Um, the black curve is as based on a, on a straight DFT electronic structure, and the blue is what we get by combining the GW method for the band structure with the beta sub meter equation for the exotonic effects. And, and then we get a, a very good agreement. Um, okay, so what we've done here is a high throughput GW study um, where we looked at, we calculated the GW band structure of um, almost 400 different 2D semiconductors. And in total, that amounts to uh, 46,000 quasi particle energies, because for each of these materials, we perform the full GW band structure. And for each of those energies, we need to calculate the GW self energy, essentially. So we have these 46,000 evaluations of the GW self energy. And they are distributed, you can see here the difference between the GW uh, and the, and the um, DFT energies. So the, deviation, the mean deviation is about an electron volt, which is pretty large. And here you can see a specific example of a PBE and the GW band structure. So uh, Nikolai here was a uh, PhD student in the group. He, um, he worked on this problem here. Can you learn the GW self energy? Um, from the DFT electronic structure. And <clears throat> what we did was to cook up some descriptions here, some representations. Um, the first one we call the decomposed operator matrix elements or NDOM, which is um, encoding information of matrix elements of the electronic states. So we have some reference state over here that we would like to uh, obtain the GW correction for. So we include matrix elements with other uh, DFT states here. And the uh, operators we use is position operator and the NAPLA operator, NAPLA operator squared. And so you can see over here, the different um, components of that endome feature vector. So it's a way of representing the DFT electronic structure, the neighborhood, so to speak, of this particular DFT state. One can cook up other types of, of similar uh, representations. Here is one that is based on um, uh, a radially uh, projected density of states that um, in, in, encodes information about uh, the projected density of states and uh, of, of, of atoms sort of in the vicinity of, of a particular atom. Uh, all of these representations are invariant on the rotations of the crystals and the choice of unit cell. So we trained uh, a gradient boosting algorithm. Um, and what you can see here is that the mean absolute error on the test set is actually going down as it should and approaching 0.1 EV, meaning that we can predict uh, the GW correction from these uh, features here with an accuracy of 0.1 EV on materials that the model hasn't seen before. Uh, here are some examples. Um, the orange curves are the PBE uh, band structures, DFT band structures that are used as input for the machine learning model. Um, the uh, green continuous curves is the machine learning generated band structures. And uh, since this is a machine learning algorithm, we can calculate this at any K point. Uh, and it doesn't take any time, essentially. The green dots are the, uh, uh, the actual GW calculations here. So you can see that it performs uh, pretty well and it's even able to, uh, you know, for the same material, distinguish between different K points and different uh, bands. They can have quite different uh, GW corrections. Um, if we try to summarize the performance here, um, GW versus experiment. Um, maybe there is an accuracy of about 0 0.2, 0.3 EV. Um, with the machine learning model, we get something uh, less than that. So we are actually closer to the GW gap uh, than the GW gap is to experiments. So that's, um, that's um, good enough. Uh, it, is, it doesn't have to be much better than this. And we can predict individual energies with an accuracy of, of close to 0.1 EV. Um, 
want to look more into this and understand uh, the role of the different features. In particular, uh, we found that it's quite important to include the uh, polarization of the material that says something about uh, screening, uh, the size of the polarization cloud of the electron in the hole, and one can learn some physics from that, but I don't think I have time to go through it here. Uh, I just want to, uh, to conclude here by saying that uh, the C2DB, I think, uh, is already uh, an, an open um, um, structure property database uh, for a lot of 2D materials, and we are making it even more powerful in the future by also uh, integrating it with a, with a database on bilayers and also point defects in 2D materials. Uh, then I talked about the atomic simulation recipes uh, with the task blaster uh, and the MyQ for creating um, in Python uh, workflows. And it's uh, kind of simple to use, I would say. It's uh, very modular and flexible. And here the goal is to be able to create uh, simulation workflows that are code agnostic, meaning that it's easy to change from one DFT code uh, to another. Um, I talked about the steep generative model, the CDVAE, um, which in combination with lattice decoration, we were able to produce 2000 new 2D crystals that are very close to the uh, convex hull and um, should be materials that could be uh, um, experimentally synthesized. And then I talked about um, an efficient method for including phone unassisted uh, absorption, which we use to identify um, these anion rich compounds within film photovoltaics and finally machine uh, learning prediction of GW band structures. And these were the people that were involved in the work and I would like to thank them a lot for um, uh, all the work they did and the funding uh, agencies over here. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening.